Oh, the irony. I thought I had a devilishly clever idea for this talk. I knew I was not going to attend LER in 20 in person. In fact, I'd already taken a stand of deconferencing. This was a plan I cannot thank enough Marin Depot and Martin Hoxie for their support. Picture this, sitting in the conference venue. My session announced. A colleague wheels a suitcase to the center of the stage. They open the top compartment, pull out a small device, look at it quizzically. Ah, it's a remote mouse clicker. They point it at the screen, and Martin plays a pre-recorded video. This one. I aim to make some semi-critical statements about conference formats and beyond the inequities for those who couldn't be there, that it's more a question, can't we do these things better for all? Do we really have to be physically there to share? So, maybe some polite applause. Alan's not here. He sent a video. Uh, but, ah, I've been there all along, watching the live stream, and Martin has me queued up to speak. I might call it colleagues I know, send regret wishes to Catherine Cronin, tease Jim Groon, or Martin Weller. I hesitated to submit this, and I credit Myron, who kept encouraging me in extending the deadline. Never would I imagine that no one would be there in London. But here we are. Here not there. And the questions I pose remain. Frigging irony pivoting us here. Before I go any further, keep in mind that as I go down this path, know that there's a huge asterisk exception for ALT. We could see the care that went into just the way they handled adapting OER 20 to the COVID-19 disruption. Insert massive applause here. Conferences have always been odd creatures to me. Also note that I'm a card-carrying introvert, and days in fluorescent-lit rooms just zap my soul. All that effort to travel to a venue and sit passively in rooms being presented to. Yes, this is a gross generalization. A lot of conferences are different. But the bulk of them, since my first one in the early 1990s, have not strayed much from the same modality. I've relished more phenomena that came from making collegial connections in open online spaces. Many I got to know there eventually I got to meet later in person. It's been there since the beginning of my ed tech journey in the 1990s, this phenomena of getting to quote unquote no colleagues at a distance via whatever communication platforms available. And sometimes when I get to meet them later in person, it's just as if we continued the conversation, collaboration we did first online. While working at the Maricopa Community Colleges in the early 1990s through the cutting edge technology of an email listserv, I got to know and start communicating with directly Tim Blood, a colleague at Lane Community College in Oregon. A few years into my career later, and tiring already of the presentation focused structure of academic conferences, I pitched my director on the idea of visiting colleagues at a few community colleges in the Northwest US. Through email, I set up a visit with Tim and two other places. But it wasn't until shaking hands with Tim in the Lane Community College parking lot that we both realized we had never even talked to each other on the phone. Talk about moments. This happened again and again over the years, getting to know colleagues first via blogs, shared photos, virtual worlds, webinars, open courses, live video sessions, and then, when travel enabled it, getting to meet them in person. I stayed in people's homes. I ate at their tables, met their families cats, dogs. These events influenced the first round of Amazing Stories of Openness done for the Open Education Conference in 2009. I was quote-unquote blown away, that citation goes to my mom, in 2011 when unfortunately my mom died unexpectedly a month before I was going to visit. Friends and colleagues online spontaneously organized a hashtag cookie love bake chocolate chip cookies, and give them to a stranger event, both in support of me, honor of mom's habit. This has become a thing I relish most about this work. Not the technology, not the travel, but the sheer magic of unexpected serendipity with people I might never have had the opportunity to if it were not for these networks. And maybe the best example I can think of involves postcards. Antonio Ventagliato was one of those colleagues I got to know first in online venues. Blogs, DS106, a friend of Jim Groom, etc. A native Italian who's been long living and teaching new media in Puerto Rico. We got to collaborating on blog syndication, storytelling projects, and ultimately he arranged for me a one month fellowship in 2016 to his university in San Juan. It's one thing to get to know someone and then meet them at a person or a conference. It's something way beyond when you get to visit their home, meet their family, sit in their living rooms, surrounded by everything important to them. 
When Hurricane Maria slammed Puerto Rico in September 2017, I was naturally worried about Antonio, his family, and other colleagues I had met there. We had just started planning an informal podcast collaboration, but that, of course, would wait. And it was a relief to get a first text message that said he was okay. Eventually, we were able to start emailing. We did our first episode of the Puerto Rico Connection by each of us recording bits of audio in a Google Drive, then waiting for a new one to appear so we could correspond. In one of his messages, Antonio said they were getting regular mail okay, like postal mail, while electricity and internet were still spotty. I got this idea to start a campaign of asking people to send Antonio and his students postcards as a show of support, hashtag care for Sagrado, in a time when the U.S. government was rather short-changing Puerto Rico on care. Soon, there was more internet, and we saw tweeted photos of students holding postcards. That was pretty amazing, but it went to another level when Parisa Moran, an educator in Japan I'd not connected with before, found out about Care for Sagrado in a virtually connecting session. In fact, Parisa sent a letter and it got to Antonio faster than my first postcard because she was wise and sent it express mail. But more than that, what really struck me and resonates was her salutation at the end that read, In Japan, an Iranian woman who has to prove her humanity every day. Wow. Would I ever have this experience in a conference hall? And Parisa took care to a whole new level by having her students in Japan create more art and presents for Antonio and his students, all sent through the regular mail. This led to a moment in December 2018 while I was visiting Kate Bowles in her home in Australia. That's a whole nother story I don't have time for. And we had a four-way audio conversation with Parisa in Japan and Antonio in Puerto Rico and me and Kate in her house in Australia. These stories of caring from afar are almost ordinary. I bet most in this audience have had their own experiences like that, where someone they had never met has done something extraordinary as an act of care. All this facilitated and made it possible by these internet communication tools. So it's not provocative to say you don't have to be there to care. We see a lot of this. We experience it. But for conferences, well largely pre-COVID-19, you had to be there to share. Predominant form of our professional gatherings seems to have barely budged. Most are still presentational centric. The things we project on a screen stem from a technology invented in 1987. And while there's a recognition of the barriers for adjunct faculty and often some financial consideration for those without paid conference travel budgets, I have to say now from being an unaffiliated outlier that it all looks a bit clubbish. In many ways, it's invisible when you are, as I was at one time, quote unquote, on the circuit. You lose sight of how many others, like an order of magnitude of others, will never get those conference travel opportunities. And yes, stream keynotes, shared slides, Twitter chats, plus the whole fabulous ethos of virtually connecting help to open parts of the conference experience. It still pits people as the there versus the there nots. And I was in that club. I did insane amounts of travel. In 2008, I was gone 75% of the year. I racked up frequent flyer miles and spewed in social media my share of what I felt were funny stories of travel mishaps. I never paid for those trips, but there's more to it than free airline tickets and hotels. In a salaried position, you're still earning paychecks while away. But now, as an independent worker, all the time away is time not earning money. And I got bills. I will nod somewhat to the assertion, and I've said so myself, that networking in these conferences is helpful for getting future work. But I don't want to make that the goal of being at an event. I don't want to be there just promoting myself. I want to be experiencing it. I could go to the opposite end and say totally online conferences offer the answer. In fact, that's going to be the only option we have for the near future. And many of them, like Alt, already do a fantastic job of creating a shared experience. And there are bold efforts, like the recent WordPress Ed conference that took place completely on Twitter. Yet most online conferences, too, give the same experience to all. And many, to me, they feel like the pivot to online learning we see now. They end up replicating the session keynote formats. Where are the hallway conversations? Where's the magic that happens between sessions? Where are the rocking chairs at the Richmond Conference Center I remember from Open Ed Conference? Those are some magical moments not on the program. My question is, and one for which I totally lack an answer, is how can we create professional networking opportunities that take advantages of the affordance of what is possible in a distributed and serendipity-infused network of care that it can be a richer event for both people present and not? Is it a crazy idea? What else can we do when we convened and are present here and there to do anything else but present? We know what the acts of care look like, the ones that are enabled by communication tools. What can we do to elevate 
and augment this act of the share.